Jonathan. My name is Jonathan Enns. I am going to be the moderator for this uh, first panel, but want to really quickly just introduce the panel, and then um, as each speaker comes up, I'll give uh, a little longer uh, bio. Um, uh, so, so uh, just as we go down in order, uh, this is Richard Marshall, uh, Design Manager at Bird Construction. Uh, next is Adrian Conrad, uh, President and CEO of the Cora Group. Um, and then we have Adrian Wang, uh, Director uh, of Innovation and Sustainability at Tridel. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, Subi Al-Sayed, is the Vice President of Sustainable Development at Mattamy. Um, so we were hoping, we had a quick talk a few weeks ago, we were hoping uh, that each of us would, um, or e each of the panel members would do a, a, a quick-ish uh, introduction on themselves and their work, uh, eight to ten minutes, and then depending on where the timing goes, uh, we'd love to open up uh, the conversation to as many of you as possible, so, um, so uh, keep track of your uh, big and important questions, uh, and we're hoping to, to answer some of those. So. Um, uh, I just want to talk uh, now about uh, Richard, uh, a quick background. Um, as design manager at Bird Construction, uh, Richard helps clients maximize the potential of their proposed project by developing innovative design and construction solutions within an affordable budget using extensive industry and construction experience and an in-depth knowledge of code standards zoning bylaws. His strong expertise in projects such as regional shopping centers, grocery stores, big, bo big box stores, suburban low-rise, and multi-story uh, office buildings primary focus at the moment is on developing design-build construction projects for commercial and industrial clients. BIRD's design-build services include functional layout, space planning, site planning, feasibility studies, schematic plans, uh, assistance with zoning, building code review, budgeting, there's a lot of stuff. His, uh, <laughs> his team offers uh, in-house design and drafting and works in partnerships with architectural and engineering consultants to offer um, total turnkey building solutions. Uh, I know that Richard is also on a number of um, interesting um, uh, uh, standing committees uh, on energy efficiency, so the National Energy Code of Buildings uh, since 2007, and a member of the Standing Committee on Environmental Separation, uh, part five of the National Building Code since 2010. So uh, we're happy to welcome Richard. Uh, how's this thing work? Right? Okay. There we go. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking uh, the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy uh, for inviting me to participate in this forum. Because it's always good to get uh, together with uh, colleagues that are interested in sustainability. And I hope that I can provide some good input to this panel today on the current and future trends in the construction industry and also uh, trends in a regulatory environment. And I, uh, on a personal note, uh, I'm really happy to be able to return to Waterloo uh, because I happen to be a student here. Um, I'm, in the, uh, I'm uh, in the midst of finishing a master's uh, uh, degree in environment and business uh, from University of Waterloo. And uh, the MEB degree is mostly taught at distance, so I actually haven't been here on campus in about two years, although I'll be back in, uh, in June to finish that off. Uh, for a final residency. Um, to, uh, to give my uh, comments some context, I'll start by giving you uh, some background on bird construction and on my own career. So first, who's bird? Um, we're a national contractor uh, with headquarters in the GTA. We have district offices that span across Canada. We're publicly traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange and we do about $1.5 billion in business a year. We're organized into three divisions, uh, buildings, industrial, and heavy civil. So I work in the buildings division, uh, which operates in what's referred to as the ICI sector. So ICI is institutional, commercial, and industrial buildings. And we'll work under any type of procurement model, um, whether that be design, bid, build, or a fixed price tender, construction management, design build, or triple P, uh, public-private partnerships, which are also often done as design build. And then triple P projects will sometimes also take an ownership stake uh, through a subsidiary bird capital. And while we'll work under any procurement model, um, we actually prefer either construction management or design build, because those are the two models where um, we can provide expertise from our staff and upfront advice to create more sustainable projects. 
Uh, Bird also owns 50% of a company called Stack Modular, which is a leading manufacturer of large-scale steel frame modular construction projects across North America. And I'll talk more about Stack, Stack Modular in a minute. Uh, we have extensive experience in development and construction of sustainable facilities all across the country. We've got a conference of knowledge of state-of-the-art strategies for sustainable site development, uh, water savings, energy efficiency, material selection, and environmental quality. We're a long-standing member of the Canada Green Building Council. We've got over 150 lead projects. Um, if you go to our website, you'll see about 70 of those that are featured. As to my own background, I'm a civil engineer, but I've spent my entire career working in design build, more specifically in commercial light industrial market. And uh, as Jonathan mentioned, a, a background uh, mostly in off low rise office buildings, strip malls, industrial distribution facilities, and big box type retail facilities. And separate from my career, Bird, uh, since 2007, I've been involved with the National Codes effort. Um, I'm uh, on my third slash fourth term uh, with, the with the Standing Committee on Energy Efficiency, and uh, I've served two terms on Standing Committee for Environmental Separation, which is part five of the building code. So I'll lend some comments here on uh, where things are going in a regulatory environment as well. So the topic that we were asked to speak on today was policymakers have made it clear that both new and existing buildings need to use much less energy and energy with a lower carbon comment in the future. And that policy stems from the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change, which is signed by every province except Saskatchewan. So for the built environment, what that means in this framework is uh, first, making new buildings more energy efficient. Uh, secondly, uh, retrofitting existing buildings, as well as looking into fuel switching within those buildings. Uh, third, improving energy efficiency for appliances and equipment. And lastly, supporting building codes and energy efficient housing in indigenous communities. So what do these four goals mean to a, uh, for a contractor like Bird? Okay. At, at Bird, we see a future where every construction project will entail these four elements that I've listed here. Uh, virtual design and construction uh, techniques, lean construction techniques, several levels of energy modeling, and better commissioning, and several levels of commissioning. So first on uh, virtual design and construction, VDC, we see that as ideally being developed as a collaborative BIM model from the very beginning of the project and then used throughout the project to streamline construction. We've implemented VDC on several larger projects and we're moving to a framework where we will implement VDC on the majority of our projects. Uh, lean construction techniques are important to avoid waste and ultimately cut both cost and the construction schedule so that instead of waste, we'll have money to invest elsewhere in the project. So the ideal project for us would be an integrated project delivery model where we act as construction manager. The BIM model for the project would be jointly developed by the project team in a collaborative environment, and lean construction methods would be used throughout the construction. Energy modeling would be performed several times throughout the project to validate the performance and a rigorous commissioning system would be followed, both uh, mechanical and electrical and envelope commissioning. We believe this model is the model of the future for our industry and it will be required to meet the goal of low carbon or net zero buildings. We also believe that modular construction is the sustainable solution for multifamily projects and especially northern and remote communities which is why Bird decided to purchase a 50% interest in Stack Modular. So Stack Modular units are completely designed in 3D, they're validated through energy models, and they're manufactured in a climate controlled facility, which leads to superior quality control and faster construction. And we're currently manufacturing the units now, which will be erected to form a hotel in a Callowit next spring. Uh, the, they, uh, they plan on uh, arriving and erecting that in April. I'll switch now to a brief update on our regulatory environment. Um, following the adoption of the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change, the Canadian Commission on Building and Fire Codes wrote a policy paper 
um, titled A Long-Term Strategy for Developing and Implementing More Ambitious Energy Codes. Uh, the graphic on that one is, is the blue one uh, that's on the left. Uh, if you do a Google search, you can find it uh, uh, residing on the internet. So one of the views expressed in this policy paper is to change the role of codes. So in the past, um, uh, traditionally building codes set minimum acceptable requirements and those were based on already established good practices in the industry. CCBSC plans to use building codes in the future to set the path rather than follow, so to lead rather than follow. So for the National Energy Code, this means establishing step codes with various performance levels. Standing committees already started work on what the future step code will entail. It may well be modeled after some of the step codes that already exist, such as the province of British Columbia step code and the city of Toronto step code. So some other positive developments that I can report on, uh, some initiatives from CSA. Uh, first one that I'm particularly excited about, CSA is uh, currently revising uh, CSA S47895, the guideline for durability in buildings, and it'll be a standard rather than a guideline and some groundwork's already been laid to reference that in the building code. Yeah. CSA has several new energy standards completed or in progress. Um, a building energy estimation methodology or BEAM is in the second revision, which is an easier method for energy modeling, and they're hoping that that'll uh, create more uptake in the industry, especially from smaller uh, contractors or smaller designers that can't afford to go to a full energy model system and they're developing a software tool to go along with that. Uh, they're looking at several commissioning standards uh, for new buildings and also for existing buildings. And lastly, they'd like to develop an energy performance modeling guide uh, to help guide the modeling industry uh, so that uh, more standard practices are followed. And that's something that modelers have expressed interest in. Um, I'd like to close with two thoughts that, I, that I'm sure will resonate in this venue. Um, the first one is to reach the goal of low carbon buildings is going to require that all businesses involved in design and construction embrace lifelong learning. And uh, I guess I'm an example of that uh, because I'm getting a master's degree about 35 years after I got my bachelor's degree. But I, I work for a large company uh, where we have money to invest in learning. Um, most of the construction in this country is performed by small, medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, and all firms, large and small, are going to need to constantly enhance the skills of their employees. So the colleges and universities need to ensure that the programs are designed for and that they're accessible to all companies, both large and small. And then secondly, while we're here at a symposium sponsored by U Waterloo, Research and development in construction in this country continues to lag, and in building science. You'll see in the graphic on the left, while this is a couple years out of date from the Conference Board of Canada, uh, it's still valid. Canada lacks, uh, right now sits 15th out of 16 OECD countries in terms of uh, business uh, investment in R&D, less than 1%. And then the graphic on the right shows you that out of that 1% investment, less than 1% of the 1%, 0.57% is invested in construction. So if we're going to meet the goals for a low carbon future, both of those statistics are going to need to change. Great, thanks for, again for inviting me here today and uh, look forward to the rest of our panel. All right, thank you. Uh, so to save more time for questions at the end, I'm gonna cut my longer, I'm sorry to my panel, I'm gonna cut my longer bios uh, because I think uh, you're doing good, a good job of, of covering um, background. But I'd like to uh, next uh, invite uh, Adrian Conrad, uh, President, CEO of the Cora Group up. So which is it, the, which button advances? Uh, this one right here. Okay, perfect. Oh. oh, what am I doing here? All right. 
Perfect. Which one? This one. All right. Technology. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, uh, I was happy to share Cora's and my personal passion for sustainability. So the Cora Group is a Waterloo region-based family real estate development company. Um, I don't know if uh, I can hold up to some of the uh, speeches we've heard already this morning, but uh, I'll certainly try. I'm here today to talk about, oh, and I also want to, uh, I am Chief Operating Officer of the Core Group, Manfred Conrad, my father, is uh, President and CEO. That uh, happens more often than, uh, I, don't, I don't know where that information is out there, but it's uh, wrong. He is a, a key visionary in, in what we do. So I'm here today to talk about Evolve One. Um, Evolve One is uh, Canada's first zero carbon design certified building as certified by the CAGBC or Canadian Green Building Council. And Evolve One is walking distance from here in the David Johnson Research and Technology Park uh, right behind us. So looking to share a little bit about what we've learned through, uh, through Evolve One, which opened its doors to our first tenant text now October 1 of this year. So the Evolve One vision was to design a zero carbon lead platinum building that is replicable at market rates and generates more energy than it uh, consumes. And we wanted to do that in a typical Canadian climate. So the first thing I would share is integrated design. We, we did a lot of homework up front before getting into design of the building of what we wanted it to be. We integrated the entire team so it wasn't just architecture, we, we involved the engineering, sustainability consultants. We actually also selected electrical contractor, mechanical contractor, photovoltaic contractor and uh, general contractor to be part of that design discussion because we felt we wouldn't have the ability to make changes along the way that you may have in typical construction. So here's an example of what Stantec did for us um, with simulating the building. And, and I'll give you uh, an example. So we went through countless technologies and systems, how they interacted together, and probably 10,000 iterations of how things combine to uh, achieve our goal. But to use a specific example, the architects told me they wanted a 30% window to wall ratio. In, and I said, you know, that's just not acceptable to our, our typical customer. I wanted 40%. So using 40%, that then told us what levels of insulation we needed in the wall, in the roof. It told us we needed triple pane windows, what level of insulation and tinting in the windows. So this was a tool that we used up front before designing the building. You know, here's a, uh, when we had everything together, here's a uh, representation of a number of the systems that were proposed, but as we went through this, I had to put this back against our vision of replicability. I needed to be able to build this and charge market rates for it. So things like a labyrinth underground were not things that uh, ended up being uh, implemented in the end. So where we ended up was we came with a few key findings. So we needed to have a super insulated shell or envelope. This was achieved through our lead platinum uh, target. Advancements in LED lighting, so with daylighting, dimmable lighting, LED lighting, and where technology is going allowed us to drop energy demands of the building a lot. And then the, the third piece of the building was we implemented a open well geothermal system and integrated that with a variable refrigerant flow mechanical system. So that between those three systems, the energy efficient envelope, LED lighting, and the geothermal VRF, we were able to bring the energy demands of the building down about half of a typical building. And then we had to create a photo photovoltaic array to offset that demand. So the building has, I think, 1,440 
solar panels, a third on the roof, two thirds on the parking lot, covering about 100, providing covered parking to about 160 parking spaces. So here's another slide courtesy of Stantec that, uh, so we've got a standard building and, and energy consumption and then e where Evolve One is. So Evolve One is about just over half of the typical energy demands. But what's interesting about this is through all the building, all the systems, we still have this plug load <laughs> um, that we're going to have to contend with in the future. So as, as we go forward, you know, I heard this morning some, some great innovation that's coming, but it's how are we going to deal with the plug load? So that, that's a barrier that we're going to need to deal with. You know, we can design this great building, but how are we going to, like people have to live in that building and, and function. So a few lessons that uh, we learned through here is you have to invest in design up front. Everyone has to have and share that same vision because if people aren't sharing that vision with you, once you get to actual construction, you're going to have problems and it's not going to work. Um, what we found in our example, energy savings are going to offset the additional costs or the additional capital costs we incurred. So we set out with the vision of it has to be replicable. Um, so the energy savings are allowing us to be charging or offering Evolve at market rates. And we're actually looking to launch Evolve 2. Um, we're in site plan pr process right now. And again, we are offering at the same rates as other products in the market. I'd also like to say our buildings are full, and I'm going to come back to that in a second because that's an important statement. So some of the barriers we experienced in, in building this, we are using unprecedented technology or applying technologies in an unprecedented way. Regulators don't know how to deal with it. So when we're coming with a 700 kilowatt photovoltaic array, your local utility is saying, uh, okay, what do we do with that? Um, geothermal, an open well geothermal system, so that's not closed loop, it's open, so now I'm dealing with the Ministry of Environment and they're saying, okay, we don't really have a box that you fit in. So it's not that the regulators don't want to deal with it, they don't necessarily have a framework for dealing with it. So there can be a high cost of approval and a long approval process. So. If, if I could, for regulators, we need certainty uh, of uh, where we're going to go with this, these things because, I mean, we need, to be we need to be setting the technology we're going to be using before designing the building and we can't be uh, dealing with issues during construction. Another barrier we found is skill sets are not in abundance and I'll, I'll use a very spe specific example. We've got a variable refrigerant flow mechanical system in the building. So in the region of Waterloo, I think there's two or three contractors that can work on such a system. There's others that say they will, but they're going to sub out to those two or three. Um, so we need the skill set. So that, that's one example. There's, there's going to be many others. Uh, another barrier we found was sustainability is not on a typical customer's, it's not on the top of their priority list. So when tenants are going out to the brokers and you know, coming up with an RFP, sustainability tends to be there, but it's not top of list, or so they think. And I'll go back to the comment I made in the last slide, but we're full. So when I think of sustainability or, or zero carbon or net positive energy, you know, I'll use an example of that uh, green bin at, at home. It's inconvenient. And a lot of people, you know, or a lot of our potential customers associate sustainability with inconvenience. And that's not the case. If you come through our buildings, you're going to find some of the coolest buildings in town. It, there's lots of light. There's better temperature control, better comfort. You're going to have healthier tenants. And it's because of that our buildings are full. They don't appreciate or don't necessarily understand immediately that sustainability or zero carbon and all these features are part of that. So there's a, you know, we need to educate our customers on that. So I, I think that's most of what I have to offer. I'll leave you with a few uh, pictures. So the building is standing over uh, a block away. 
We've got uh, here, you can see the, uh, how we've used the solar panels. And uh, so what, you know, here's to, to my last comment, the, the lobby has a 40-foot living wall. We've got 5,000-odd plants in that, that wall. What's key about that is you walk in the building and you go, okay, something's different here. So you see the solar panels in the parking lot, okay. You see the living wall. Because when we have a solar wall, we, if we have uh, you know, a variable refrigerant flow system, no one understands that. No one's going to see that. They see the living wall, they see the solar panels, and hopefully they'll ask questions. So thank you very much. All right, Adrian Wang. So I've titled today's presentation, The Low Carbon High Rise Building. And uh, we're going to be taking a look at what a typical Tridel building looks like for, for the most part, the typical um, high rise building stock in Toronto. So just give you a brief background on Tridel. Up on the top left corner over here is a picture of Jack Belzotto. He was our founder. Um, initially, the company started with Jack and Sons. He had three children, um, Angelo, El Elvio, and Leo Delzato. So the name Tridel derives from the three sons, and that's probably 80 years <laughs> into our history. So since then, we've built about 80,000 homes, mainly in the GTA, uh, primarily in the high-rise sector. So the agenda for today is to primarily cover off three topics I want to discuss. Uh, like I said earlier, to take a look at the typical high-rise housing stock in Toronto, and then more specifically to look at the Toronto Green Standards and what that means for us. So the Toronto Green Standard pertains to the municipal green building requirements uh, for all new high-rise buildings in Toronto, and it's incentivized. But it's really changing the conversation around energy efficiency to talk about low carbon. And practically speaking, I want to talk about what that meant, uh, along with all the challenges and opportunities that it presents. So when I say a standard high-rise building in Toronto, Really, I should qualify that by saying that that's a TGS version 2, tier 2 compliant building. It's LEED BDNC 2009 gold certified. Uh, and it's important that we make those qualifications because all these standards are getting cha uh, changed, updated. There's new building code updates, fire code updates, strong green standards going through its latest iteration of changes. LEED itself is going through changes as well. So it's important that we distinguish what that really means for us. And I'm going to really dive down into the brass tacks of what our standard building looks like. And for the most part, I'd say that 80 to 90% of the high-rise condo buildings in Toronto are pretty similar. Most of them are designed by the same design engineers. We tend to use a lot of similar architects, mechanical electrical consultants, uh, building code consultants. So I can say with uh, a pretty high degree of confidence that you know, most of our buildings will meet these standards or specifications. Um, so on this page, I've listed out the envelope specifications. And the first number that's kind of probably going to hit you between the eyes is that wall above grade um, R value. It's very low. Um, so it's important here that I note that this is the effective R value. So there's a big difference between the nominal R value and the effective R value. The nominal R value of our buildings is close to R30, actually. But now with all the latest round of energy code changes and the way we model our building, it's actually asking us to take into account all the thermal loss of our buildings. So because of that, because of the thermal transmittance from different materials, precast, spandrel to window wall, and the balcony slabs themselves are taken into account in the models now too, that R value has dropped tremendously down to about R4.8, and that's hitting our energy model really hard right now. And that's part of the changes that we're going through that we're seeing. The R value for the roof is pretty standard around R20. Uh, glazing, it's represented by a U value. That translates into about an R3. And that's for a double pane, low E coated argon filled window. Again, all this is pretty much cookie cutter. Even the window wall ratios hover around 40, 50%. Uh, the other thing that I want to know about this is that uh, when we talk about the window wall ratio, the baseline that you're comparing your building to is a 40% window wall ratio. Um, but it's not prescriptive, so you can have mechanical trade-offs. And typically, in the, the, our conversation in the past has largely revolved around what those trade-offs look like in terms of the performance metric. So most of the savings have come more on the, on the backs of mechanical electrical improvements as opposed to envelope improvements. But going forward, because of all the changes to the way we model our buildings, that conversation is now shifting. And I think it's a shift in the right direction, too. Um, this is a slide on our electrical specifications, and it's largely centered around um, the lighting power densities in our buildings. 
And the only remark that I want to make here is that perhaps we've sh given too much attention to lighting, because when you look at the uh, lighting power densities, the usage in here is actually fairly low. You know, you're anywhere from 5 to 7.4 uh, watts per square meter. You're talking about nominal gains in performance. And I think almost all that discussion revolving around lighting improvements, whether it's PoE lighting, low voltage lighting, daylight harvesting, occupancy sensors, all these new technologies are great, but you're hitting that point of diminishing returns. And I think more focus needs to be uh, placed to different assemblies or different uh, envelope systems as opposed to lighting systems, because this is more of a distraction than really uh, a method of us really progressing that sustainably forward. And then the last thing I want to talk about are the mechanical specs. So when you look at the high -rise, typical high-rise building in Toronto, the mechanical specs probably are the most cookie cutter. Most of the buildings in Toronto are heated hydronically, which is just a fancy way of saying that's heated with hot or cold water. I mean, the Romans had it from their early years from, with uh, their aqueducts, and um, essentially they heated their homes with hot, hot water and steam. Um, but that's effectively how we heat our buildings or cool our buildings now today as well. So typically you'll see a central plant with centralized boilers, centralized uh, chiller plants with chillers, condenser pumps, cooling tower, so on and so forth. And that gets pumped into fan coil systems, which, which are distributed throughout the suites. So it's not, it's not like a single family home where you have forced air system. And forced air is not a very effective way in a 30 or 40 story building of distributing that energy. So instead we rely on water. Um, we also have compartmentalized HRV units, which hover around a 65% energy efficiency, along with uh, bringing the fresh air directly in the units for a better ventilated environment. And if you look at the plant level, you'll see the high efficiency condensing boilers, the high efficiency non-condensing boilers, and then like I said earlier, typically it's the centrifugal chiller uh, with VFDs on the pumps. And I've also listed domestic hot water. Uh, consumption rates up there as well, because that translates into how much gas you're putting into heating up that water for domestic consumption. So a lot of boring stats, <laughs> but where does that land us? So on this page, I've presented four, uh, four uh, on this graph, there's four different buildings. Um, we took a look at our standard tall point tower building, which I've called building A. Uh, building B is more of a squat terraced look, and then you'll see that closer to the waterfront because the city wants to preserve those views, so more of the buildings tend to be uh, shorter as well as more terraced. And then we've compared that against the latest round of Toronto Green Standard changes uh, for their version 3 update. So TGS is incentivized. Uh, tier 1 is a mandatory requirement. They're requiring us that going forward, we have to report on three metrics starting from 2020, at least for tier one compliance. Um, and that includes energy usage intensity, which I'll talk about, or which is presented in this slide, um, thermal energy demand, and the greenhouse gas emissions. And tier two is incentivized in the form of DC charge refunds. So you'll see right off the bat that our building A actually didn't meet uh, the version three requirements, which was a bit of a shock to us because the way it was presented to us was, this was a version two, tier two compliant building, and that would have cascaded into a tier one compliant building, but we found out that that wasn't the case. So we took a deeper look at it, and there's a few things I want to point out to you. Um, so I've ordered this uh, in terms of generally highest consumer to lowest consumer, starting off at heating and domestic hot water. And if you compare that to the buildings for TGS version one, sorry, version three, tier one, and tier two, you'll see that that's actually the greatest opportunity for improvement. So this goes back to the slide that I had about electric, electrical improvements and lighting improvements. You'll see that actually electricity doesn't represent a huge portion of our buildings. And more importantly, there isn't much opportunity for improvement either, whether that's a tier one or tier two compliant building. And that's because we're getting to that point, like I said, where we're squeezing water out of a rock. It becomes increasingly difficult to find those energy gains. So I believe that the way forward is really to focus on the lowest hanging fruit, which in this case would be the heating, space heating, and domestic hot water heating. You'll notice that there's a steep drop off between building A and building B in terms of the domestic hot water consumption. And that's largely because this is based off an intensity factor. So that's a factor of how big your building is. Building B just happens to be a larger building with less bathrooms per square foot, and hence the domestic hot water consumption was less. We also uh, tweaked. Uh, the flow rate, so that dropped off as well. So in this slide, again, I just want to highlight that the bulk of the energy consumption is being allocated to heating 
in domestic hot water. And I'll go into that a little bit further. Um, whereas lighting uh, and other equipment, fans, cooling and pumps, are generally presenting a pretty baseline condition of your building. To Adrian Conrad's point earlier, you're getting to the point where people still have to eventually live in their, their houses, they still have fridges, they still have dishwashers, they still have plug loads and appliances. And there's very, it's very difficult to get around that unless there's a huge cultural shift in the way that we cook our meals or, or clean our laundry, so on and so forth. Um, so I wanna focus more on the lowest hanging fruit here. Uh, the other slide I have up here is a slide about our greenhouse gas intensity. So this takes a deeper look or deeper dive at building A, the tall point tower, which is more standard or typical of, the, of a high rise building in Toronto. And you'll see that, again, we failed it on both counts of, or on both tier, tier one and tier two compliance. The one thing that I wanna point out here is that what's driving us off the cliff here in terms of performance is really that gas consumption. And this goes back to what I said earlier about focusing on space and domestic hot water heating. So what are our key learnings here based off these energy models and these graphs? Um, the first one is obviously business as usual cannot continue and we're seeing an advent of a lot of new technologies that are pushing us forward in a positive direction, but it's really causing um, a bit of rift between us and the trades as well. So there's a large uh, push back from the trades in adopting some of these new technologies. Um, it, it brings up whole issues of supply chain management, finding the right vendors, the right suppliers, the right distributors who will actually promote these new technologies, which I'll go into in a bit in a slide. Um, but the two things that really stood out to me through this, uh, these design threats was the best opportunity to lower energy usage in our buildings is mainly through the envelope systems. And that's a big change in our conversation. As we talk about uh, as we shift in our conversation about energy efficiency to carbon reduction, we really have to look closer at the envelope. And the second thing in here that I want to point out is that there's a shift away from hydronic systems, uh, buildings are heated with hot or cold water, into VRF systems, refrigerant-based technologies like heat pumps and other VRFs. And that segues into this slide that I have up here. What are the challenges and opportunities? Um, it, I really cannot overstate the impact that that shift away from hydronic sh systems is having on our budgets right now. We've tendered out a couple of buildings with VRF systems and perhaps the trade pool is a little bit different out here in Waterloo. But what we're seeing in Toronto is that the trades have a large influence over the mechanical systems that are selected. And in the past, I'd say 10 to 20 years, the plumbers have really run the show on that. So when you break down a mechanical contract, into its constituent parts. You talk about the plumbers, the sheet metal workers, the refrigeration trades, the building automation trades. But the plumbers really run the show. And what we're seeing in terms of pricing is that there's a huge pushback in not wanting to bid on these contracts. There's a lot of projects that are on the go right now. There's tons of cranes up in Toronto. There's tons of construction going on. It's very exciting times for all of us. But the, the I guess one of the drawbacks of that is that the trades kind of get the pick of the litter. And so when they're bidding on a project that's a standard point tower with a typical two or four pipe fan coal system versus a heavily terraced building with VRF systems, they're not gonna wanna bid on the VRF systems. And we're seeing that in terms of the pricing where prices are inflated by a factor of two or three times what a typical mechanical contract should cost uh, on a per suite level. And that's having a big impact on our budgets, on our performance, on the way that we design our buildings going forward. So that's really got to change. The second aspect that Adrian Conrad brought up was that the refrigeration industry is not exactly geared for um, a heavy rollout of all these VRF systems. Uh, typically refrigeration trades tend to be fairly small, uh, mom and pop shops, a lot of small businesses that run, uh, run these outfits uh, for VRF systems. And typically you'd see it in small electrical rooms, small CACF rooms, LRE machine rooms, but definitely not on a large scale in all the units. So again, it's reflected in the pricing um, and it's reflected obviously in the labor pool. And as I alluded to earlier, the supply chain for a lot of the envelope improvements are still lacking in Toronto. We work with some of the largest window wall manufacturers, uh, Toro Aluminum Windows for, uh, for one, and even they don't have a triple pane product right now. We actually just recently built a net zero energy dwelling unit one suite that was completely compartmentalized, had a VRF system, had its own solar PV cells, uh, triple pane windows, balcony slab breaks. And we had to go all the way to Vancouver to procure the windows for us. So there's a big logistical challenge along with these envelope improvements. And obviously, 
as people have alluded to earlier today as well, the, the changing political climate doesn't provide the, for the stability that we need to make long-term business decisions. Uh, case in point, we recently evaluated a district energy program for one of our largest sites that we constructed to date. And you know, as we were in that boardroom humming and hawing over what we should go forward with that, a big question mark revolved around what was gonna happen with the HPNC credit before the provincial election. And you know, as soon as, um, I won't name names, but as soon as he was elected, that was one of the first uh, uh, mandates that he rolled out that that was gonna get quashed. And so that's having a large ripple effect in the way that we design our buildings and the way that we forecast our buildings. And our buildings have a long business cycle. You're talking from anywhere from four to seven years. And so we really need that stability more than anything um, because without that stability, it's great that you're getting this money coming in if you get it, but that's really a bonus. That's just really icing on the cake as opposed to really propelling the, the right decisions to be made at the very outside of a project. And the last thing I want to mention is that um, with all the changes uh, politically, even at the municipal level, it's getting very convoluted as well. Uh, there tends to be a heavy silo mentality. I talked a bit about the district energy programs just to kind of beat a dead horse. Uh, we looked at removing, obviously with the district energy program, we didn't need these large mechanical rooms anymore. So we're saving anywhere from five to 7,000 square feet off probably the most premium square footage of our buildings being the rooftop of our buildings. And we wanted to recover it in the form of GFA, saleable GFA, which obviously made a lot of sense to us. But the way that the city of Toronto designs our buildings, they actually discount any mechanical electrical spaces. And that's why all these cooling towers and boilers and heavy mechanical uh, plant equipment sits up in the roof. Nobody wants to see it. It's the most expensive space you're gonna construct. It's the most valuable space that we have but it's very short-sighted in the way that the city designs our buildings. They're, they're not willing to discount that space, or sorry, give us back that space if we put in a district energy program. And I can tell you for a fact that if they made that, if they rolled out that change across the board, people would jump on board in a heartbeat. If you gave us back 5,000 square feet and saleable square footage, we wouldn't have any conversation around contribution costs for you know, district energy programs, whether we're gonna go ahead with it, you know, really counting dollars and cents, because that space is, the most valuable space that we have, right? And then the last example that I had with um, some of the issues we're facing with the city right now is with water balancing on our sites. After having constructed literally a concrete jungle in the city of Toronto, they're realizing that the infrastructure is not sized to support uh, the rainwater runoff from these concrete buildings, and it's having heavy implications on the way we design our buildings. So they pretty much turned on a dime and told us that we needed to put in these large stormwater harvesting tanks to use that water on our sites, at the same time, they told us to put in drought-tolerant species, which barely used any of that water. And so now we're left with these giant pools, the concrete pools, sitting in our parking garages that we have no idea what to do with, and along with that, all the waterproofing challenges that we have. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's a very exciting time for us. We're going through a lot of changes, um, but there's a lot of opportunities here as well. I want, definitely want to emphasize that fact. I mean, I've spoken to several mechanical trades before too, and I think they're really getting um, the idea now that you know, refrigeration is the way forward. And you see it all across Europe, all across Asia with heat pumps, VRF systems, but North America is really late in adopting some of those technologies. So along with all these challenges, there's a lot of unique opportunities that I think the early adopters will really benefit from. Um, and that's it, that's all I had for today. All right, last but not least, we have Subi El Sayed. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, I don't always sound like this, so excuse my, uh, my voice is disappearing. If I say something that's not clear, I'm happy to repeat it. Okay, one thing I'm gonna promise, my slide do not have our values in them, so I'm not gonna, even gonna go there. Uh, so thanks for having me here. Um, my name is Subi. I work with um, a developer called Mattamy Homes. Uh, for you, of the, those who don't know Mattamy, Mattamy's been around for 40 years. Uh, we build um, residential dwellings uh, across uh, North America, so we're in Canada and the U.S. Uh, we're a uh, product range, uh, obviously, from low-rise communities, which is our primary product, to mid-rise, uh, and to a lesser degree, uh, high-rise, mostly in the GTHA. 
Mattamy is what's known as the production builder, which means like we're mass produce volume-wise um, uh, buildings as opposed to the you know, niche boutique builders. So uh, I'm going to give you an overview of the key initiatives we've been working on uh, over the past two years since I joined Mattamy. And then hopefully we'll uh, we touch on a lot of uh, issues that I didn't get a chance to mention over the question period. So our first project I'm going to go over is the, uh, I like to call it low carbon community that we're currently in the process of uh, the de detailed design um, stage. So this is uh, one phase of um, over a thousand home community in, in the city of Markham. Uh, it's going to be the first geothermal community in, at this scale. Um, I'm guessing Ontario, probably Canada. Um, what's unique about this, or the innovation, is not really that it's geothermal. Geothermal has been around since the 70s. It's the innovation in the business model. So what we've done here for the first time, we brought in a utility partner. We're going to install, own, operate, and optimize all the mechanical and heating and, and, and cooling systems and domestic hot water systems in this community. So now, your heating and cooling in domestic hot water is coming to you just as a service, just like electricity. What does this mean? It means that you're, you're not responsible of netting your home to zero or making sure it's low carbon or dealing with uh, sophisticated equipment that's not really your furnace that you grow up in because that's, we found that that's what happens and if you start targeting or downloading the responsibility of operating uh, higher end equipment on the homeowner, that the homeowner, the average homeowner, uh, don't really have the ability to optimize these systems. And for the most part, it causes the frustration and failure to achieve the targets. So we partnered with N-Wave, who is going to own and optimize the systems, including the infrastructure, all the way up to the um, higher end uh, uh, ground source heat pumps are going to be part of the system. So it's a full holistic system. But also means it's better envelope, better windows, more comfort, because What's good about this model is also change the ROI equation, how we look at the business case. Because now if I invest in the envelope of my house, I'm reducing the cost of N-Wave, who have to dig up fewer geothermal boreholes. And one key success, or one of the key uh, factors that helped us get to this stage uh, of this project was the city of Markham that became a partner with us on this project. There's so many regulatory barriers buried into the, the system that if you, if you get the buy-in from the mayor, you won't know that these things are actually happening at the front line. So we're able to overcome all these barriers at this point, and we basically removed all the regulatory risk that we could anticipate at this point. It's only because City of Markham was instrumental working with us till today uh, on this stage. And eventually we uh, were able to... Um, uh, get uh, funding from the Atmospheric Fund to uh, help us go ahead with the detailed design. So now we're at the point we're going to go do the field testing, verify the capacity of the geothermal uh, in that area, and hopefully come up with some more details on the financial model of this, of this uh, community. Uh, the second initiative here, also around resiliency, because we, we look at sustainability or sustainable development in three prongs. Sustainability, whether it's you know, energy efficiency and, and the traditional um, um, convention, and also look at it as resiliency. Uh, for somebody like us, resiliency means a lot, especially if you build in a place like Florida, where it's you know, hurricane prone, uh, and uh, there's a lot of uh, weather-related uh, um, impact. Um, and also we look at innovation, which I'm, I'm going to touch on it later as well. So one of the initiatives that we started uh, changing on how we do things in Florida is we are now installing solar street lights. And when the uh, hurricane hit last year, that picture in the middle, that was the only light available in that area because the grid went down. So there's two parts to this story is that your house could be blown off and nothing you can do about it, but your neighbors will lose power and the, their house is still intact, but they can't really live there because you lose power, they lose, so there's no refuge, there's no safety. So this is one step towards getting us to that stage. Um, the, other th the third one I'm going to touch on is our um, strategic partnership with Ecobee. And I say strategic partnership because our, our, our working, with, working with Ecobee, they're not a vendor that who's selling us thermostats or smart thermostats. Uh, and Ecobee is not a smart thermostat. Ecobee is on the roadmap to become the house operating system. That's why we partnered with them. So what this means to us, meaning now for the first time, 
homes are going to be smart and digital because if, you keep, if we keep on building analog homes, when the grid changes to smart grid, when the city starts delivering smart city programs, there's no communication, no interface between the homes and the houses or the communities that we build and the smart infrastructure and the smart ecosystem that's developing around them. So effective March this year, every house Mattamy builds across North America comes in with included, it's not an option, it's an included feature, an EQB4 with a built-in Alexa, uh, which the homeowner has the uh, ability to uh, turn it on or off. So what this means is that each Mattamy Homes comes with a baseline, smart device, smart energy, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. And our goal now is to build on that and add more features to it. Um, smart energy. So uh, we're, we're, we're dabbling into now with smart energy and, and uh, uh, battery storage. And it's not an easy thing to do because we're limited on what we can do with this technology. We're only, by, by regulations and energy regulations, we're only allowed to uh, leverage this technology behind the meter, which limits a lot of the value to the customer perspective. But we are, we're doing a pilot in Phoenix because in Phoenix, the peak demand charges are higher than anywhere else we build. And that, that made the business case for this pilot. So we partnered with um, a smart battery company out of the Bay Area. Um, and we're, we're basically studying how would this look like from a utility perspective, from a customer perspective. So we built the first smart energy home that has a smart battery system, solar PV, smart appliances from Whirlpool, a smart uh, uh, car EV charger, and EcoB. And together, we're, we're integrating all those features together. And we want to know how, what does this mean to the customer, what does this mean to us. And most importantly, we're able to trick the interest of the, uh, the uh, utilities there. Because right now, utilities plan the peak the day before or two days before. It's like, on the blackboard calculations. But what happened now, it's like the democratization of energy storage. You now you can buy a power wall or any battery from Home Depot in the US. So when people at random start buying and installing these battery storage, there's no more peak by the conventional definition that we know. Uh, we don't know if these batteries are gonna be charged by low carbon energy or high carbon energy or what time. So the impact is, is when, it, when it happens at random is really uh, a dreadful, especially to, from a utility perspective. So what we're trying to do is trying to replicate the utility model that we did, that we're working on right now with Markham and apply it to batteries so that they become an aggregated asset as opposed to just random you know, energy storage features in individual homes. Uh, we're also um, looking at uh, mobility and transit uh, because you know we, we build communities we don't just build houses uh, so now with the advent of smart mobility and mobility on demand and autonomous vehicles we need to understand what this means to us we want to know what does this mean when it comes to planning a community when building homes can we start building uh, single car occupancy homes when you when you build outside of the um, you know downtown areas so we partnered with Mars, uh, Discovery District, and the AVEN, the Autonomous Vehicle Innovation Network, and we're working with them and with other stakeholders who include um, Metrolinx and Ministry of Transportation and a, and a number of municipalities and technology companies like Uber and Lyft, uh, Pantonium. Uh, so now we're at the early stage of developing exactly what this means to us, and we're hoping to be able to, uh, one, provide some in insight on how the development uh, process works, because not everybody knows that very well. And what does that mean when you come to regulating autonomous vehicles in a, in a, in a community? Um, and also, um, what does it mean from a customer perspective? Because we always overlook the customer. Like, are they, do you want autonomous vehicles to be running in their uh, communities? We don't know. So maybe you know, piloting this technology would g give us even more realistic feedback. And uh, back to my earlier comment about smart homes, because when you look at technology like autonomous vehicles, they need sensor-rich environment. So when your homes become smart, then that would provide some of the sensing capabilities. When you put in smart uh, solar lights, that would have built-in sensing smart capabilities in them as well. So we're building those features and, and the infrastructure feature, features step by step. Um, and, you know, but back to the comment that was made earlier this morning about innovation, it is not easy to innovate. And you know what? Innovation is, is a slow process. And if you think you can 
uh, you know, in a month or two, you change everything, and it's not going to happen. So it has to be a slow process, but with an end in mind. You have to set goals, but you work toward them slowly, and you, it's, it's also an inclusive process. You have to bring everybody. Um, our industry is not known for R&D spending or R&D infrastructure, so I like to look at it as innovation as a service approach, meaning like we partner with st strategic partners like Ecobee, so they have all the data analytics capabilities, so we can work with them on understanding how our buildings perform and then make sure we improve our products. We partner with, with companies like N-Wave who have the utility capabilities, you can design geothermal, they can maintain it, they have skin in the game, they can operate it. Uh, but also we like to partner with uh, academia, so because this is where we can test early stage technology and, and work with their students um, and help us, you know, move things outside of the, the, the construction sites because there's very limited things you can do uh, when you're talking about R&D on the construction sites. Um, so right now we have partnerships with George Brown College. Uh, we, uh, we actually, they helped us tremendously with uh, building information modeling. Um, and we're also uh, work, doing with, uh, working with Humber. We're testing some things uh, that are kind of confidential right now, but they're pretty exciting. And hopefully we'll be able to work with the guys at Waterloo as well. Uh, and then, you know, we do a lot of other things like, you know, the uh, flood resilience, working with the uh, intact insurance and in Waterloo and um, well community, Energy Star, obviously. And now we're, we're, we're uh, hopefully we'll be piloting Energy Star for mid and high rise as well. Uh, hers, which is mostly predominantly in the U.S. Um, yeah, so a lot of things, and hopefully we'll be able to cover more uh, during the question period. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to join you guys once uh, a mic starts working, but I'll speak from up here. Um, thank you all. Uh, I think it was, uh, I think uh, in trying to think about uh, the important questions to, to ask this group, um, uh, it, it was obvious that uh, having uh, uh, an overview of the technologies, the policies, but also the, the questions of how to connect these things to, to money um, is, is, is what would be really interesting to talk a little about uh, at the beginning. So I just really have two um, uh, maybe simple questions, and then we can open up to, to the rest of you. Um, so I'm thinking about the, the kind of uh, the market um, and the two sides of the market, the supply and the demand. Um, so uh, first is kind of an open question about uh, policy and how policy impacts uh, what you can actually supply people. Um, if you had advice, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it out to, to the gang and see if anyone wants to take it. Um, if you had one piece of advice for policymakers that uh, would, would uh, lower the carbon impact of the products that you're currently producing, uh, what would that be? Um, anyone interested in that question? So advice to policymakers, um, and obviously don't want to get into a big political discussion here, but um, and I think there's two options in policy, and that's regulation, and, and that's letting the market uh, price in externalities. Um, and we've sort of taken both paths. Um, as I alluded to earlier in my uh, career, I've spent a lot of time working on a voluntary basis um, in regulation, um, and the Conservative Party seems to be leaning toward the regulation end of things, where the Liberal Party obviously is is trying to uh, price carbon and and price in that externality. Um, there's really inherent problems in both right now. Regulation is a provincial responsibility under our Constitution, at least in in codes, and um, because of that we really end up with like a hodgepodge of regulation across the country. Um, I've worked on the National Energy Code, um, as, you know, as I've mentioned, I've been very proud of the work that we've done on it. Uh, the uptake and the adoption has been slow. Um, the, uh, Saskatchewan uh, still doesn't have the Energy Code, although they are uh, implementing it uh, finally on uh, January 1st of 2019. Um, the 2017 version's out where I um, uh, reside and, and work in Manitoba, we're still using the 2011 version. Um, so, and then Ontario has their own, uh, they use SB10. Uh, Quebec seems to think they have to write their own energy code as well. So regulation's problematic because of the way the Constitution's set up. And unless we have a national policy, um, 
you know, we're going to continue with this kind of mishmash of, uh, of regulation across the country. Um, the other side, and, and like, I believe in carbon pricing, but the way it's been approached, I don't think is the right approach right now. Um, I think we need to rework the entire tax regime. Um, you know, the liberals have um, brought in a, um, a price on carbon in the four provinces that don't have it. At the same time, they're giving out subsidies to some industries. So they're saying we're going to tax you on one hand and we're going to give you a subsidy so that you can uh, uh, continue to operate on the other hand. Uh, they've announced that they're going to give or more money back to people who live in rural environments than urban environments. So again, that's another subsidy. And they're layering that on top of the regulation. So I, I honestly don't think it's going to work. Um, it all boils down to kind of the short termism of the election cycle and getting reelected and what spin you want to put on it. We really need some long range thinking and you need to decide on a path. Are we going to let the market decide and have carbon pricing, or are we going to regulate and pick one or the other? Okay. Excellent. Okay. Anyone else? Well, I'll, I'll take this one. Is this, is this on? Yep. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's so much you can do with policy and building codes and regulations. You can't really like rely heavily on policy to advance you know, performance of buildings or what we do. You need a balance between yeah, you have to regulate the, the very minimum, but also you have to work with the industry. Uh, you can't, and what we noticed that with policy, uh, you know, recently there's even disconnect within the own government, like the, within the different levels of government. Um, there don't, there's no conversation, there's no buy-in, and that's gonna translate into conflicts in, when, when these things are rolled out into the market. Mm -hmm. And let's not forget, I mean, there's, there's nothing that markets hate than uncertainty, and there's a lot of risk with when you're talking about, uh, you know, when there's things uncertain. And the recent example with cap and trade is a perfect example for this. So we started this geothermal project when there was cap and trade, and the business case was great. Now suddenly there's no cap and trade, and then the business case is not that great. Um, but is this like why should we rely on the political volatility? Uh, and you know, when government's lifespan is four years. Our projects are more than four years. Innovation should survive more than four years. So I think I think there has to be a, a balance. There have to be uh, certain levels of what policy should drive. And you know, I don't know. Like, we look at our where we live now. We live in a very diverse country and diverse economy. I don't think there's one policy that's going to be applicable to all of Ontario. So can we also download some of these responsibilities on the local governments and the municipalities? to work with the industry to customize some of the aspects of, of the regulatory side. I don't know, I can talk forever, so my voice <laughs> is not helping today. No, I mean, we have, we have such a, uh, I mean, I think we have a wide uh, mix of people here, but I mean, that's a, that's a valid learning point. We produce long-term things, things that take a long time, that have an impact for a very long time, and it's a problem when our regulations don't follow. Um, both follow the buildings, but also don't give us the ability to invest in a, in a future project. Um, okay, my, my other quick question um, is actually on the other side, uh, is on the, um, the demand side. And I know, um, Subi, you mentioned like, um, thinking about the consumer is not something, you know, that, that's such a surprising thing, or it would be in another industry. Thinking about the consumer is not something we often do uh, enough. Um, I think it, it but it might, it, I, I mean, this is a question, is that a potential? Um, but also, uh, how do we, is it important, uh, does consumer demand, is consumer demand an important potential uh, in our industry? And could we generate more informed or, or more uh, a strong demand from consumers? Uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, you know what, I, you don't mind taking this one in. Um, <laughs> No, we don't. Like, I'm speaking for residential. I don't want to, obviously, commercial and, and retail is a different story. With residential, the customer have no influence over anything. Like, nobody, I mean, I worked with Tradell, I worked with Manami. Nobody comes to walk into this, you know, to the sales office and say, I want a lead building. No, that doesn't happen. Right. And not because lead is not good, not because Energy Star is not good, because people don't understand what this means. 
like here today, we're talking about zero carbon. Uh, people don't understand what zero carbon is, but if you tell them it's a healthy building, it's more comfortable, it's going to save you money, yeah, you're going to have some exciting things in the house, you can talk to your thermostat, you can talk to your light switch, right? That's excitement. So then like, okay, zero carbon is not what I saw in the news when politicians are battling each other and calling each other's name about it. No, it's actually good for me. We, we, that message is missing from, from here. Like we, um, all the rating systems are addressing the developers, the architect, the engineer, but the average customer is absent from this equation. What we're trying to do when we, when, for this uh, geothermal community, we wanted to give the customer the first time to experience at a scale what it means to live in an energy as a service community, which it could be geothermal in this case, it could be fuel switching, heat pumps, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Technology is not the issue. It's how you deliver the experience to the customer. That's missing from in the, in the residential side. If you look at office space and commercial, their tenants and customers are more engaged. Right? And keep in mind, with residential, the business model, and, and there's nothing wrong with it, it's just different. Build cost efficiently and move on, move away. We don't own the asset, so that changes how we look at the ROI. So customer is gonna, was going to inherit the ROI, so customer have to know what does it mean to build better buildings on, on them. Like nobody buys, I don't know, do you buy a car on plan? <laughs> No, I mean, the, the automotive industry is a great comp for what we do. Anyway, I'll, leave the, uh, I'll give others a chance to talk. Adrian, you, you must work with, um, you work in the area, a lot of people in, in Kitchener-Waterloo, high technology. Do you notice a demand for, from the client for lower carbon products? So, is this on? Oh, or, is it on? On now? No? Or yes? Yes. Okay. Obviously, the, in a commercial application and likely industrial as well, the, the end customer has a high influence on what is built. Um, in a, a lot of what we see, customers are coming out with RFPs, so they basically work through a broker who goes out and searches the market and goes down the checklist and then bring that back to the, the end customer and, and how do they make a decision. Uh, I think the comment I made in my, in my sh slideshow was uh, sustainability or, or zero carbon or low carbon is not typically high on that list. We've seen over the years lead, um, lead is on the list, but I find it quickly to fall off as soon as it costs a dollar a square foot more or, or you know, the, the financial impact comes into it. So I think the industry needs a way, needs to find a way of communicating that differently. As I was saying, I, I think when you have a lead building or a zero carbon building, by nature it, it's a well-built building, it's going to be a class A building, so it's going to be better than most in the market. And the indoor air comfort, air quality, access to windows, those, those are all great things that customers are going to enjoy, they just don't know to be asking for it yet. So I think there's, a, there's an education process that needs to continue. And Adrian, uh, you're in Toronto, uh, dense market, probably um, more expensive products can be offered there. Do you see any difference, or, or if we think of Toronto as a leading, a leading market in maybe new, new products that can support support them financially, do you, do you see any changing trends or products in, uh, that are being offered in terms of lower carbon? Hello? Just testing. Yeah, we're definitely seeing a, a big shift in the market right now. Um, the past few years, uh, the construction industry, at least in the high-rise game, has largely relied on low interest rates, and low interest rates have really generally promoted investors to buy on spec or on plan. Um, so when you're buying on plan, you're really not evaluating whether this is a green building or not. You're really looking at the ROI on renting out that place. There's a lot of amateur landlords, obviously, in Toronto. Uh, Airbnb is really taken off as well. But with rising interest rates, I, you can't really overstate the impact that's having on our clientele right now, that there's a lot more end users. And so as there's more end users who are actually going to live there, who want to enjoy the space, Definitely there's a, a bit of a shift in that conversation towards green products, sustainability, innovation, 
you know, we recently rolled out our version of Tridal Connect, which is um, our, our look or our take on smart community systems. So there's tons of gadgets and toys you can buy out there in, in the realm of smart home systems, but there's not a lot that ties in the community scale of these buildings, of high-rise buildings specifically. So we're looking at it from that angle. But that's really driven a lot of traction with our clients um, because they're looking at, you know, what does it really mean for them to live there now, right? We're, we're launching one of our latest projects at Evermore. They're larger suites, larger, more practical, use, usable spaces for laundry rooms. So you can actually have linens in there. You can wash your linen, so on and so forth. Spaces for uh, to age in place, for strollers and for wheelchair access and all that. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a big change in the market when it comes to sustainability or innovation or just making the space actually usable as opposed to just buying on spec or on plans. Amazing. Those are, those are my two questions. Uh, now, uh, given the time, uh, we'd like to open up to uh, any audience questions. Thank you. Uh, I have an observation question, and I'd like to hear your reflection on it to see uh, what you think. So I'm thinking of homes as virtual power plants. The idea that you have a solar roof, there's a battery, perhaps an electric vehicle, being able to interact with the power grid and being able to manage intelligently both the load demand, being able to feed power back to the grid, the homes in a suburban community perhaps connected. And this is not far-fetched. You know the example, powerhouse, power stream, north of Toronto. They have 20 such homes, and they claim that the benefits in terms of uh, cost reduction to, to homeowners is in the order of $400, $450 per quarter. So this is real. But it's intelligent devices, sensors, connectedness of homes uh, that really begin to use, begins to use energy so much more efficiently and help begin to lower the carbon footprint of these homes through innovative technologies like combination of solar thermal, uh, the geothermal, and so on. So any thoughts on your ideas around how you may or may not move down that path? I have ideas, but I don't think I should say them here. <laughs> I'll, I'll just... OK, well, it, can I explain something here? Maybe you know how utilities work, operate, right? Utility have a huge reservoir and a huge valve I'm using analogy for electricity. So the, they can only open the valve once a day and close it like the next morning, all right? Uh, so once they open that valve, all the stuff has to come out. If they don't have customers to sell it to, then they're losing money, and they've been losing money for years. So when you start producing your own electricity, you're competing with them. So if you can change this dynamic, then yes, then we can do a lot of things with power storage, with smart energy, until this, this dynamic changes, I, it's just tough. And I've, I've been working with Electra and PowerStream and others in the US as well. It's the same dilemma. It's the same. So there's a conflict in the business model. If you're stealing customers from the utilities, they're going to lose money. They're mandated to make money. And right now, they don't. So things will change. Either they're going to be ugly and they're going to be a disruption when things just kind of like, or hopefully we'll, we'll be able to work together so that the aggregation of, of the assets become part of the uh, you know, assets owned by utilities and managed by them. But I, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what the solution is, but, or I don't know what's gonna, how we're going to move forward to that solution. OK, I've been told uh, no more questions, but I feel bad. Uh, can, one quick question. <laughs> one more. Yeah. OK, well, one of the comments that was made, I think Adrian made it, is uh, business uh, as usual cannot continue, and that kind of struck stuck with me. One of the things I hear a little bit about, but not really flushed out, is what I call life cycle management. You know, you guys are builders. What happens after you finish and you leave? The operation and maintenance, the performance of that building is part of sustainability. Any comments on that? Yeah, definitely. So as part of our lead certification process, we commission all our buildings. We also have a sister company that monitors our buildings and ensure that it's actually um, performing in accordance with the way we modeled it. So whenever we see an anomaly in terms of electricity, water, gas consumption, we flag that to the condo board. 
And we have the benefit of having our own in-house property management team. So there's you know, clear channels of communication that are open between us, the property manager, and the condo boards. And that's really helped towards facilitating these buildings to ensure that after we've constructed and left the building, that they stay green and that they function that way as well. Um, perhaps something that we left off in our conversation, or at least in my piece, is talk about the mod I thought you were going to go in this direction, was the full life cycle analysis of our building, so the embodied energy of our buildings. And, you know, Craig talked a lot about that this morning with uh, mass timber. Uh, it's something that we are looking into. Concrete's one of the worst offenders when it comes to carbon, or carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. So it's something that we're turning our attention towards. And there's a lot of benefits to it, too, like you had mentioned, talking about the scheduling impact. Uh, the changes to the form or schedule, early stripping, early reshoring, removal. Those have real uh, practical dollar value implications to the way we uh, model our performance. So that's where the rubber hits the road. And if it meets that litmus test, then it's really going to accelerate those technologies going forward and really going to put us in the realm of getting towards a, car a truly carbon neutral building or carbon perhaps even a negative building by looking at the full life cycle of these buildings. And that's our strategy moving forward. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, I'm really glad you raised the point on life cycle cost and life cycle thinking, because that's something that's really near and dear to me. It's part of what I'm working on in the, in the master's that I'm doing here at, at University of Waterloo. I've been, as a builder, I've been trying to speak to clients for years about life cycle cost versus first capital cost. But um, as a builder, you know, we need a client. And we need the client to embrace life cycle thinking, and they don't. Okay? Uh, for the most part, uh, in my business, we're working with uh, developers. And those developers are building a building that they're going to lease. And they're signing triple net leases. And under a triple net lease, all they care about is, is collecting the rent. The utility costs are paid for by the tenant. The property taxes are paid for by the tenant, you know, it, and the maintenance costs are paid for by the tenant. So to build that uh, rationale, we need to change the entire paradigm of the industry. Okay? The only type of leases right now that are the only uh, sector that really doesn't go with a triple net lease is the government. And on a government facility, they, they build the maintenance and operations, and they build um, utilities into the lease so they're responsible. Um, Actually, I said the only one. Uh, another one that we've been involved in, and, and Bird does a lot of triple P work. Some of the triple P's we've done, uh, as an example, we built 18 schools several years ago. As part of the consortium on that for 20 years, we are responsible for all the maintenance, and we're also responsible for utilities, and we're responsible for making sure that the energy doesn't exceed a certain maximum level. Okay? But that's the exception, it's not the rule. And we have to change the entire thinking away from low bid, okay, first capital cost into, into the life cycle and, uh, and get away from the way the industry structured if we're going to make a change. Adrian. Yeah, just, just to be clear on the, uh, the recovery, that, that's a very yeah. good comment. So yeah. if you build a building that's going to deteriorate, yeah. Yeah. your lease actually allows you to pass those costs off to your tenant in a, in a commercial lease. So there, there's something there that's interesting. Um, so like, you, like your utilities, so if the building's inefficient, you, the customer pays it as opposed to the, the landlord. And, and tenants, a, a lot of them, even sophisticated tenants, say they look at it, but they don't. Um, so that's one side of it. Another thing is I'm not aware of any lender who when I build a building that's, uh, so under LEED there's a, some, you get points for durable buildings. Um, so when we design our buildings, you know, you're, you're designing elements that last 50 years instead of 25 or 50, instead, I can't remember the, so we're designing buildings to last twice as long. I don't have a lender who will lend me more money or will give me a uh, lesser interest rate for it. You know, so th that's another example of where the industry just isn't embracing this. Okay, uh, unfairly brief. I feel like we could talk for another hour. Uh, but uh, first, thank you guys uh, all together for a great uh, overview. Um, I, I've been scribbling furiously, but I'll, I'll walk away with uh, an idea that we need to really think longer range in terms of 
maybe government policies, but also like what happens to uh, uh, the commissioning and what happens with, with the life of the building, um, but also more maybe more interaction between uh, the government and, and the industry in trying to create uh, future directions. Um, thank you guys very much. Yeah.